I'm not one to complain about the heat, but it is disrespectfully hot out today. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel where I cover nostalgic, obscure, or otherwise strange content. It's been a while since I covered anything in the computer games of old category. A few weeks ago, my brother came to me with this uh, system that he was using to play old archived flash player games. And he was kind of reliving all of those games that we used to play when we were little in the early 2000s. And a couple days ago, he and I sat down and played this game called the LEGO Studios Backlot game, which was a game that was released in, I think, 2001. Um, and it was part of this, you know, play to promote their LEGO Backlot or LEGO Studios sets, which were these LEGO sets where you could, like, build the making of Jurassic Park or other movies. I can't remember which ones were there. I'm looking at the Wikipedia page. Oh, I'm sorry, Brickopedia page, something that I did not know existed until right now. And yeah, there were a lot of these sets. Spider-Man, Steven Spielberg movie maker set, Carstunt Studio. Look at some of these figurines. Look at generic director who totally isn't meant to look like Steven Spielberg. <laughs> Ooh, look at that Spider-Man. Iconic. But yeah, basically to promote these sets that were uh, supposed to let you kind of recreate a studio backlot in Lego, they made this game called the Lego Studio Backlot. Uh, we, we are going to talk about today because when we played it through, my brother and I, we were smart enough to record our gameplay and oh my god, this game is hilarious. It's so funny because it's such a silly game, but it genuinely is one of those things that made me want to work in TV and film, uh, which I do now. And it's funny that this is part of my origin story, you know? All right, sorry, I'll, I'll just get into the game now. So after deciding to be generic girl instead of generic boy, okay, there's no sound yet, but I feel like, oh, oh, God. Yeah, he warned me that it was gonna be loud, like it recorded really loud in system. Jeez. All right, so this, the story of this game starts when you, a random pedestrian, just walks onto a movie back lot. A hilarious concept that would absolutely never happen. One time I showed up for work to a back lot that I had been working at for like a month straight for the same exact production, and the, the guy at the security gate looked me in the eye and was like, who are you here to visit? And I'm like, my my job. I, I'm employed here. I'm an employee. Also, right away, the sound effects? Impeccable. What? <laughs> I'm just picturing somebody with, like, two little blocks of wood just, like, making the walking sounds. Also, god, they make you, like, attack people just to talk to them. <laughs> so we get this cutscene where this very angry-looking Lego actor runs up and is like, just venting to us. Again, the random human that has no business being on this back lot. He's like, Ma! My hat and my pistol and my binoculars are all gone! I need them for my scene! As if they wouldn't have, like, extras of those. So according to him, the production is being held up because he cannot find these props that he needs. This guy's name is Johnny Thunder. He says words like tarnation. He has an angry eyebrow down to express his dissatisfaction at the current situation, and he accuses us of stealing his props, which in actuality he just misplaced them. Uh, and so now we are just voluntarily going to find his missing stuff and save the production of this movie. Yeah, there's several places that are built up like you're supposed to go in and then you never go in. Like we never go into this like production office here. They make it look like we're going to and then we never do. I was really sad. Also, yes, this video is gonna be a lot of me, someone who has had film experience complaining about this non-existent anymore game uh, for children and how it gets all of these aspects of filmmaking wrong, so I'm sorry in advance for that. Like we meet this character who's apparently the best boy and he says he hooks up all the lights on set, which is not wholly accurate to what the best boy does. 
definitely an oversimplification of their job. But more so, I'm concerned with the fact that everybody is wearing like dress pants and button-down blazers. Like all of the crew is dressed this way, which is not how any crew member is ever dressed in my experience, ever. Like everybody's just standing around in blazers. In real life, you're like running around crazy, you're wearing cargo shorts because it's the only thing that has enough pockets for all the stuff that you need. And like an old t-shirt that you haven't washed in three days and you're hoping nobody notices. Like that's that's what crew members actually wear. <laughs> also, my poor brother, who is pretty proficient when it comes to gaming. God, why did I say that like a professor? He's proficient at gaming. He's very experienced. He plays a lot of video games. He wants it to be known that, to quote him, the controls in this game are ass, because they were made in 2001. Also, there's like these big signs that very clearly tell you where everything is on set. That's probably one of the most apparent deviations from an actual set. Like, like if you're lucky, you'll get like a piece of paper telling you where things are. But no one on set has time to set up these really fancy directories, like we're in the Hundred Acre Wood. <laughs> All right, I don't know what this lady does, but she's like simping for Johnny Thunder. She wants his autograph, which will come in handy for us later. To their credit, they at least added in these like crew members driving around on like different golf carts and things like <laughs> essentially moving equipment and things around the back lot, um, which is a nice effort to kind of add commotion, but there's not nearly enough like action going on on the soundstage. Like there's no PA running around with a walkie in one hand going, oh shit, if I don't get the stand-ins taped, they're gonna kill me. Like nobody's having a nervous breakdown. It's so unrealistic. Then we meet this girl who's a grip and she says she just moved somebody named Rex's trailer into stage one, which if she was a grip, she wouldn't be moving trailers. But anyway, she just starts quizzing us on T-Rex trivia for some reason, and I was very confused. And then later on in the game, I was um, more confused when I figured out why, but we'll get to that later. Also, my brother legit thought this was a trick question and all three of these sums added up to the same total, which is endearing because it means that I'm not the only one in the family who sucks at math. Then there's this guy who's the prop master who does not leave the back corner of the lot at all and he gives us this quiz where he's like, look at these random movie posters that are here for no reason. If you can tell me which movies they're from, you're on the road to success, kid. <laughs> which is not much of a quiz because obviously these are the movie posters for the Grinch live action movie, another Cinderella story starring Selena Gomez, and Toy Story 3. Come on. I love how we're apparently the most clueless person on earth. Sled? Slippers? I do not know what these things are. I'm only interested in movie gear. Then we have to climb up onto this upper balcony using these boxes, which definitely seems to go against OSHA, to talk to the wardrobe lady who's like, hey, random person that I literally just met right now, try on the actual wardrobe that I need to put on the main star of this movie to see if it fits. Keeping in mind that the star of this movie seems to be a middle-aged man and I seem to be a college-aged woman. And then she's like, I'll give you a little privacy so you can change. Meanwhile, we're up on this third story balcony where literally everyone on the back lot can see us. This one time I went into the wardrobe trailer for something and I had to change. They like left me behind this curtain and they closed it. They're like, we'll give you some privacy. And I'm like, okay, I turn around and I'm in the back of the trailer where the entire back of the trailer is just like a glass door. And like all these crew members just can see straight in. So I'm like, this is great privacy, thank you. They did what they could though, I appreciated it. And then we just keep the outfit. We never give it back. We just parkour off this ledge and then we just wear it. So that's weird. Then we meet this guy who's a PA who says, the most accurate thing in the entire game, which is if you want to learn to be a PA, you have to learn to run. <laughs> if 
you want to be a PA, you've got to learn to know everything and materialize out of absolute nothingness when you're needed. This guy, and I, we never find out exactly who he is. I don't know if he's like a producer or an actor or whatever, but he's just lounging in this lounge chair reading Variety magazine. They didn't even try to give it a fake name. And he tells us that the tour guide has lost one of the props back here so we can get this. Well, it's his hat, so it's not a prop, but it's one of the three things that he's lost and he needs. And so we now have that. And we run our clumpy little feet back to give it to Johnny Thunder. Wait, we also found the pistol? Where did we find the pistol? Oh, we found the pistol in the- His pistol, his prop pistol, which was loaded with blanks, was just in the pocket of his wardrobe that we are now wearing. And no one found it but us. Just an actual gun chilling out in this wardrobe that we just happened to fu- okay. Anyway, we have two out of the three things we need. So what's the third thing? His facial expression never changes. That's one of those weird things with the Lego people. They're facial- they're just committed to one face for their entire life. But anyway, he's so happy about getting the first two items back that he gives us an autograph to say thank you. Oh boy, your autograph. Now I can go to college. But it's not entirely useless to us, because remember that tour guide that really wanted his autograph because she was a simp? We can give her the autograph, and then she just volunteers information about where the third prop is. The prop that is needed, imperative to the movie, it's holding up production. She's holding this information hostage until she gets an autograph. Why? Why couldn't she just tell us that before? Why did she need to be bribed to tell me that? God, I'm not over it. The thought of them not having duplicates of anything and therefore one singular missing prop being the thing that holds up entire productions. Hilarious. It's a hilarious thought. But she basically tells us that the binoculars uh, are up on this cherry picker, which if you don't know is this big like lift thing that they use to like send people and equipment way high up for various reasons you know, for various reasons you need that, you need to do that for different- to get different shots. I'm explaining it very badly, but you know, it's like a giant crane with a basket on the end. Like, that's what it is. She tells us that the binoculars are up there because Johnny Thunder himself was riding up on the cherry picker and using the binoculars to spy on people? Something that sounds very sketchy that I'm not gonna ask any further questions about. Once we find the cherry picker in question, uh, we meet this gaffer named Hank who is trying to get this generator thing started. So we have to like get his toolkit and help him with that. And he's like, hey, random person that I just met right now, go start this generator for me while I'm holding on to this wall wire. This live wire. So we do that. Almost kill the man. He's like, ouchie, don't do that again, please. <laughs> yeah, you hear this like fun little jingle? That's the, hey, you just electrocuted a human being sound apparently. But now that we've done that, we get the binoculars down from the cherry picker, which has the camera, the very expensive camera, still on it. But, you know, I feel like I'm being annoying now. I'm overanalyzing. Sorry. <laughs> and now that we've gotten him his third and final thing back, he's like, Thanks, kid. Y'all want a job? Because <laughs> that's how employment works. And even if we say no, he's just like, nah, yeah, you do, so... We're just being forced into labor that we don't want, if that's the case, I guess. So we come back the next day, and we're a full-fledged PA. We're still in the wardrobe from yesterday that's not even ours. We also get a gigantic locker that you could just fit a human body in. God, that was a dark way to put that, but you know what I mean, like it's a giant locker. Like, PAs don't get giant lockers like that, that's not a thing. And we get a walkie, and it was at this point that we were like, hey, could we close ourselves in the locker? And then we did, and it worked, and then for a second we couldn't get out, we thought we had glitched the game. And right at that moment, our new boss started yelling at us over the walkie, and we were like, oh shit, we're about to get fired in this non-existent job we have. Yeah, I'd love it if crew members actually got, like, locker rooms like this. This is just not a thing, and it makes me sad. I want this to be a thing. It'd be so convenient. And then no matter how fast we run, he's still yelling at us, like, hurry up. We're like, we're hurrying. We can't teleport. Give me a second. And so now I'm getting pissed off at my fake boss 
because again, this is a children's game, and this job that we have does not exist. But this is the thing that bothers me maybe the most out of anything else. This is so anxiety inducing. He tells us to go into one of the sound stages and get coffee orders for everybody, right? That's fine. But the light over the door is blinking, which is the universal signal for, hey, we are filming, do not open this door because you will absolutely ruin our sound and therefore our take and then you'll get fired. And instinctively, I wanted to wait for the light to stop flashing. But we're supposed to go in. The light never stops flashing. Just as a tip, if you want to work in film and you are ever on a back lot and you see a light flashing over a soundstage door, do not go into that door. All of your coworkers will hate you and you in turn will hate yourself. So then there's this whole sequence where we're like parkouring around the soundstage. Wait, is this guy sleeping? Oh my god, I forgot about that. We just electrocuted ourselves. Did this guy electrocute himself? Is he okay? Is he alive? This guy doesn't need coffee, he needs an ambulance. Anyway, we parkour around this soundstage, apparently while they're filming, just completely disrupting the shot and everybody trying to get their work done so that we can be like, hey, excuse me, hey, hey. Do you want coffee? <laughs> so then we get all the coffee orders and we go to the cafeteria. We meet this person. Thank you for putting the stairs right there, game designers. We meet this person who must be like an extra or something. He's in a super cool outfit and we never get to talk to him. Like he's just not relevant to this game at all, which is sad because he's by far the most interesting character. You're working, you're sitting down. You're not working. Don't lie to me, liars go to hell. <laughs> so we go and make these coffee orders with these coffee machines that have these god-awful sounds. Oh, my ears. God, it hurts my teeth. Also, side note, the cafeteria apparently charges money for food, which is a hilarious concept to me because out of all the chaos that happens on film sets, the one thing that is always a constant is free food being provided to you. That's just the thing. Like, thanks to the unions and things that are in play, like, they're obligated to give you lunch, and it's customary for them to also give you breakfast. So that even somebody like me, who is a non-union worker, I might not get health insurance, but I sure as hell get food provided for me. So I just can only imagine the uproar, the anger, the protest, if you tried to make crew members pay for their own meals at work. It just wouldn't happen. Also, who eats spiced eggplant? Spice with what? Oh, and then this is one of my favorite parts of the whole game. We meet this guy, who's apparently the sole writer of this movie. The movie that is currently being filmed in the soundstage next door, right? He hasn't finished writing the movie. The movie that is being filmed in the soundstage next door. <laughs> and why is he so far behind? It's because he's got a broken heart. He's in love with one of the main actresses of the movie who does not know who he is. He's creeping on her from the incel shadows, <laughs> just like wallowing in self-pity. And the script for the movie we are currently filming is not done because of it. What? <laughs> uh, so anyway, we give everybody their coffee order. It was at this point that we forgot to actually take the coffee cups off of the machine, which is kind of funny that the game mechanism lets us do that. So we had to like realize that we didn't have the coffee when we went to give our bosses the coffee and then we're like oops and then we had to clop our little cloppy feet back get the coffee put it in our backpack and then go back walk of shame wait what does the speech bubble say there's like a piece of equipment just like swinging in and out of the why is this set so damn dangerous why does everything look like a episode of wipeout it's not supposed to be this dangerous, you guys. Uh, so once we give everybody our coffee, our boss um, gets on the walkie to tell us that because we got everybody coffee, a very normal thing to do, we've saved the day and this heist scene is gonna get shot on time and on budget because of us getting people coffee. America does run on Duncan, but I think that's a little bit dramatic. I think you're giving us a little bit too much credit. He puts us in for a promotion because we did one task correctly. We didn't even do it correctly. We forgot the coffee and we shoved it in our grimy little backpack. 
But anyway, we get promoted from second unit to first unit, which is where the magic is happening, and they've got a situation. Their family went away on a week's vacation. Sorry, I always do that. I hate myself, I'm sorry. So we show up and our boss is like, listen kid, everything's going wrong. I like how I said it, like I'm paraphrasing, but so far I'm literally just reading what's on the screen. Steven's going crazy. I assume that means Steven Spielberg? Like, is this a Spielberg production? Because I guarantee you Spielberg productions are a lot more organized than this. The first AD is home with the flu. So instead of calling it a replacement, they're just trying to do this without a first. Horrible idea. First assistant directors have so much responsibility. Sets would literally crumble around us without them. The stuntman is out sick as well, so we're all gathered here today to shoot an alligator stunt scene. God only knows what that is. Without a stuntman, for a movie whose script is not finished yet. Oh my god, this is truly Hell World. And Rex, the main actor, is too depressed to come out of his trailer. Poor Rex. Alright, so we've gotta save the day. The brand new PA, well, we've been promoted. I wonder what we've been promoted to. Anyway, the new guy, that's us, has to save the entire shoot all by ourselves. He won't come out of his trailer. Dinosaurs are very proud of their size, and he's crushed. So he's playing a dinosaur and he's just really method and he's sad because a tabloid called him skinny? I'm so confused. Anyway, we now have to find something to cheer him up to like coax him out of his trailer. Like here, Rexy, Rexy, come get a Snickers bar. All right, we can't go in here because only the stuntman is allowed in here because it is an actual pool of alligators. They're not using like CGI or anything. They're literally gonna have a stuntman just swim through a pool of alligators and no one's gonna bat an eye. So we literally just yoink the stuntman's costume. Apparently we are a one-size-fits-all society because Lego people all are the same size, I guess. But anyway. Wait then, why would the tabloid have anything to say about Rex's size? Not only are they promoting false beauty standards, but I just think they're promoting something that's physically impossible in this universe. And with the costume on, the guy who's guarding the alligator tank doesn't realize that it's literally the same person from two seconds ago. Even though the stuntman is supposedly homesick with the flu, he just thinks we're him and lets us do the stunt scene. Like, we jump up there and, like, without last looks or second thoughts or anything, they're just like, okay, we're rolling now. Go ahead and jump on these actual live alligators, random human. Also, they're, they're counting takes out loud, which, thank God, they don't do in real life. They never announce, like, okay, this is take 16, because Steve didn't learn his fucking lines. <laughs> like, that's not a thing that happens. Thank God. Oh, and we got it in one take. We're not getting a safety. We're not doing anything like that. We got it in one angle. We don't need any other angles. And now we can all go home, apparently. Well, we can't all go home, but they say that's a wrap even though it's not a wrap. Do you know how angry would people would be if they were like, okay, that's a wrap, and they just meant like the one scene is over? Because that's a wrap means get your stuff and run out the front door because we're going home. <laughs> Quick before anybody changes their mind and wants extra coverage on something, just get out of here. <laughs> so they did know it was me. Those sons of bitches. I could have been eaten by an alligator. And then we find this random piece of rhubarb pie and are like, here you go. I'm sure the depressed actor will come out of his trailer for this. Random food, just collecting dust, and it's rhubarb pie. Does anybody like rhubarb pie? Maybe it's just me, but I do not care for rhubarb pie. I know, super hot take. It's what you all come here for. <laughs> all right, so the last thing that we need to fix, the last problem that needs to be solved is this damn script writer who won't do his job because he's got a crush on some random girl. He won't even talk to her. You're so heartbroken that you're holding up a multi-million dollar Steven Spielberg production and you won't even talk to the person? So yeah, we fix his problem for him, just like we fix everybody else's problem. We go and we steal flowers from the main entrance, which I don't think we're supposed to do at all. And then we just show up in our little stuntman outfit that we also stole and we hop onto set while they're filming and are just like here main actress here's a flower <laughs> it's from that random script writer who you don't even know his name i love how she throws this in 
A lot of ladies have a crush on Johnny Thunder, my co-star. But he doesn't do much for me. I prefer quiet, bookish types. He doesn't do much for me. It's not often in a children's game that the main character says, I'm just not sexually attracted to that person. I look at him and I'm not horny at all. <laughs> so we give her this flower and we're like, it's from Frank, the screenwriter who's too much of a little bitch to come and give you this flower himself. And she's like, oh, he's so cute. And she gives us a love note to give to him. Why do we have to do this? Just talk to each other, people. This is your sign. If you've got a crush on somebody, and it's not like a stalker situation, you actually like know them and you have a crush on them, tell them. Worst case scenario, they'll reject you and it'll suck for like a minute, but then it'll be over with. I promise. Big sister rant over, let's finish this damn video. I'm Steven the director. It's like they didn't want to say that this was Steven Spielberg, but all the while they're selling an actual Steven Spielberg Lego figurine. It's confusing. They're literally shooting a scene and he's like, I need, I need Frank to get me that script so that I can shoot this scene that we've blocked out and set up and we're literally just waiting around for a script. I don't, like surely there was someone that actually had set experience that they could consult for this project, right? Like if you're gonna teach kids about movie sets and go into enough detail to teach them what like grips and best boys are, at least give them an actual like play-by-play -play of like how sets work. At least tell them what they're getting in for. Like have a second second just like in the corner crying like we're gonna be behind schedule today. All the extra shoes are too loud. We're never gonna get clean audio. Like at least, at least like give a little nod to like what sets are actually like. And then we give Frank the note from the actress that literally says I love you. They've never spoken to each other in person. Uh, but he's happy, so he gives us the script, which he had, so he really had it done the whole time, and this bitch was just holding it hostage, keeping us all here past overtime, just because he didn't have a girlfriend, I guess. And then we give the script to Steven, the director, and he's like, congratulations, kid, I need somebody to direct my second unit, and you're just that person. I'm promoting you to director, kid. Congratulations. I can't imagine that ever being something that anyone ever said to me. That's insane. But are you ready for my favorite part of this whole game? This is the very end, okay? This is how the game ends. The last shot of the game is the actor, you know, the one that wouldn't come out of his trailer? He finally comes out of his trailer and he's a fucking Tyrannosaurus Rex. An actual T-Rex is the main actor of this movie. Not a guy in a costume, a real prehistoric creature. Why are we bothering to make movies? Why are we wasting our time? If one day somebody figures out how to resurrect a Tyrannosaurus Rex, it just feels like nothing else will matter. You know, nothing else matters. If Tyrannosaurus Rex has come back from the dead, I can't imagine sitting at this desk and just being like, well, time to bitch about another computer game from the early 2000s. Because Tyrannosaurus Rexes are real. That feels like you should drop everything in your life and only talk about that for forever after that. Why was it the game about that? <laughs> that feels like the main story. But anyway, that's the end of the game. I saved Johnny Thunder's new picture and got promoted to director. All in one day. I'm really out here being a girl boss, guys. <laughs> but yeah, that's the end. I don't know. I just feel like I've been rambling. I hope this is actually an entertaining video for you guys. I know you guys like it when I talk about film related stuff, but I hope it, this isn't just annoying and me like complaining about some game that doesn't even exist anymore. But I had to talk about this game because one, it's very silly and two, it just brings back so much nostalgia for me and I just want to know that somebody else out there remembers this game. Because this game genuinely was like one of the first moments where I can remember being like, oh, working on movies, I want to do that. And now I have, and I have knowledge that allows me to complain about how inaccurate the game is. So we've come full circle. <laughs> but yeah, if you've watched this far, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching, liking, commenting, subscribing, sharing. Everything you do to support this channel means the world to me, you guys. You're the best. If you're new here and you're a fan of nonsense, maybe consider sticking around because I post nonsense all the time. Truly, the people who have been here for a while will tell you, I will complain about anything. <laughs> Just remember, 
My name is Avery. I'm a YouTuber if you say so because thanks to you, this is technically a YouTube channel. And I appreciate this technical YouTube channel, so thank you. Bye! It was a real fucking dinosaur. I can't- I'm, I'm not over it.